Good morning, Robert. Good afternoon, Good Robert. Yeah. Good afternoon here. <laughs> How are you? I am good. I'm good. And thank you for sending me Lila June's tape. That was lovely. It was it was pretty stunning to me because with um particularly with the my friends that from the emissary days, um particularly touched on you know the the differences of taking the same sensings, the same information from different sources, you know, and sort of not condensing it, freely letting it flow from one's differ, you know, differentiated point of view into the world. And I just thrilled to hear her describe what she's doing to to Dar Jamal. Um, you know, the, and this is, I think, one of the primary reasons why I've, you know, stuck with this deep dive that we're doing is that, you know, we get totally different points of view than ever I could imagine. Mm -hmm. I just love that to bring all of this out. And, yeah. but in specifically when she started, she, she made the point that human beings are critical to not denigrate, you know, the human race, just because we've goofed. Our consciousness is, you know, yeah, we're still children. Pretty, pretty bad, but it isn't for everybody. I mean, there's some people who are rising above that, and um, that's the thing to keep in mind. Um, anyway, I was I was thrilled to listen. Plus, she originally caught me by saying, you know. Um, yeah, it may be terrible what we've done in the U.S., but uh, it's been done for millennia, and in particular throughout Europe. They just did it in a different time period. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I I love that she really brought forward um, the the learning that I think has happened in Europe. I I, mm -hmm. I just. Um, heard this collective gasp when Putin went into Ukraine because the Europeans are done with war. <laughs> they just realize it's just, it's not, there's just no reason to do that. It's just so devastating and you destroy so much of what you love that there's no point in it. And they kind of assumed everybody around them have believed that and Putin just blasted through that and it was just such a shock mm. so it gives me hope actually that they will because they really are committed to that to figuring out a way to do that um, and, and I have to say I know there's a lot of um, backlash to to Biden because he's supporting Israel and all of that. And yet I don't I I see it sort of you've got this bad kid and you're trying to make him realize he doesn't have to be so bad. And so you can't do that by telling him he's bad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that he's really just saying, you know, you, you've got to be better to these people. Um, we're not saying that you're bad. We're, you know, we'll support you. We're here for you. And you can't do that anymore. And whether he gets it or not and how he comes around to that is going to be a whole other thing. I, I just see Biden very much doing that worldwide um, and having to deal with, with people who are bad, <laughs> who are doing nasty things. And you either put yourself in opposition to them or you try and bring them around and you don't do that by being in opposition to them right. so blatantly you know there has to be some sort of gentle outreach even in spite of all of the nasty things they're doing and i see him very much working on that level yeah so I agree. yeah yeah good morning ani hi could, could, you, could you tune me into what you were just discussing well i had just um was 
thanking Robert for the uh, link he sent me to a talk by Lila June Johnson. I don't know if you know who she is. I like her. I've heard yeah. her before. Yeah, she's yeah. Like and she's following in her mother's footsteps very much so. Uh, and that got us into a to talking about Europe because she does this wonderful history of humanity in a really lovely way. Yeah. Um, and she talks very much about how Europe has sort of gotten their lessons and we're, we've not gotten it yet. And Europe is, in my view, has very much decided not to do war, <laughs> that they're really trying to figure out how to work together. The EU and all that is, is an attempt to that. And their shock at Russia um, at Putin in particular, going to war with the Ukraine and how what a shock that was to that whole European system because it's so close to them and they had really thought that we'd all decided not to do that. <laughs> so and I, I was just listening to NPR on the radio and this gentleman was um, revealing facts about what's going on in Gaza mm -hmm. that I was not aware of in terms of Israel as conducting genocide yep. on Palestinians. Yep. And that's shocking to me. Yep. Yeah. No. Yep. That's, that's, that's been shocking my, to the world. <laughs> that's not a, my experience of Israel and living in Israel for two it's years. Not, it's and Netanyahu. Living. It's not Israel. It's Netanyahu. Okay. Power, power at any cost. Yeah, yeah. He's. I mean, he's he's very Trumpish, and he's just got this. He's got this attitude that. But I do think. I mean, and this is what we were talking about. Is is Biden's. Because Biden is being tarred with supporting Israel and how bad that is because of Gaza. And yet what I see is that he's trying to turn this bad boy Netanyahu into getting some sort of release from the anger and fear that he's coming from very gently. Um, so he's telling Netanyahu he's supporting Israel, we're behind you. Don't worry about that. But <laughs> why don't you have a peace? Why don't you give them the, the ability to do this? Why don't you? Uh, so I, I see him very delicately trying to turn this without being in opposition to the negativity that Netanyahu is putting out. So there, it, there's it, nothing wrong with with being um non-supportive or corrective or yeah, it depends on how you do it right right yeah, but i'm 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 kind of shocked yeah oh no that's yeah and the whole world has been shocked i mean it's oh. it's created this huge conundrum for people worldwide but especially here because of the ties because of the strength um of the jewish lobbying can i say that um you can and 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 the zionist movement you know which is really like you know jews above everything um and there's this now crush because you want to support the jews you know what they've been through all of that and you can't do this <laughs> at the same time and it's just this huge conundrum for so many people they don't know how to articulate it if you say that you're tired for oh you don't like jews you're you know and that's not the point at all um it's this behavior cannot be allowed it doesn't matter who you are you don't do that to other people period it doesn't matter <laughs> what your history is or anything else you don't do right. that that's right yeah. And we're, it's just real hard to say that because people don't want to accept it. They want to justify it. You know, it just, yeah, it's really murky. Well, there's, there's also this aspect of um, 
especially younger people, you know, we want what we want and we want it now. And yeah. in terms of the, you know, the agitating for peace or whatever, right. um, they're, they're losing complete patience in working with what Biden, which could bring about exactly the worst thing that exactly. they could have had happening, yeah. but that's all right. They're going to do that. Um, there's very little patience. And I, you know, I remember when I was that age, there's very little patience, you know, just full emotional outburst. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what sparked the Magnus stuff too, is stirring that impatience. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Of, of stirring that impatience, making people impatient for the change that is due them and all that other kind of stuff, that whole rhetoric just inflames people instead of making them compassionate and more committed to doing what needs to be done they want to just stop everything and, and break it basically um yeah they're totally well yeah with all sorts of rationales about why they deserve it <laughs> yeah i uh, i I don't understand. It's hard to under. It's it's hard to comprehend. Yeah. The the social frameworks we've created, the yeah. relational. Our our relationships with each other, on on a on a on a global scale, on one finite planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I see the same thing in race relations, that when you treat people badly, it's really hard to believe that they're not going to treat you badly. Exactly. You know, and so that fear of, well, we've done all this to them, so they're, of course, they're going to do that. How could we possibly be getting over that and, and really stopping to listen and hear where people are, um, you know? When you don't do that, you just want to protect protect yourself, which is Israel's thing. We've got to we've got to be safe. We've got to be safe. Why? Because you were nasty to the Palestinians when you took their land, and so you can't believe they're not going to be nasty back to you. But, it's really hard to do. <laughs> but the, when Israel came and took the their land, took the Palestinians, that they were just coming out of. They were just coming out of the Holocaust. Yeah, yeah. Find yeah. The safe space that Israel was. Yes. And so yeah. that dynamic colors everything too. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I I totally understand why they want a safe place. They haven't had one for so long. I absolutely. But I would suspect that um, they would get it if they could sort of create a dialogue with the Palestinians about being grateful for being there and how we together can build this land, that that dialogue would totally change that dynamic. It, yeah. it would give them the safety that they need. They would feel loved around them instead of not feeling love around them. I mean, you're much more friend, you're safe among friends than among enemies. So why would you create enemies to live among? I mean, it just doesn't. There, there's a whole leap of faith required there, though, because yeah. there is no yeah. trust. Yeah. Uh, they. How else can you, you know, in any way understand the continuous um, usurpation uh, of the of the West Bank lands? Well, even 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 the Gazan lands, but those those were relinquished some years ago because it just wasn't working. There was taking, you know, three thousand troops to you know to protect the the settlers that were there um, wasn't working. But the West Bank is um, totally different. It, that land just keeps the, the actual Palestinian land just keeps disappearing. And um, talk about MAGA, the, these, these settlers are probably MAGA on steroids. 
I mean, they're yeah. actually out there um, burning people's homes and killing people and doing it with impunity and have been for 10, 20 years. Um, so, uh, oh, 40 years, yeah. So, I mean, well, after, after the in, intifadas, um, first and second intifada is what I was mainly getting at. It's, but it never stopped, you know, from the, from 40 years ago. But, you know, it's that there has never been enough trust to give peace a chance. There, there's a considerable amount of, uh, of information, documentation that, that Hamas was a policy choice. Yes, supported by Israel. Supported by Israel because it would constantly erupt. They knew that and expected it and welcomed it yes. because it gave them a chance to strike back and always keep things in chaos. Right. Which is what they wanted, control through chaos. Um, yep. And I think Net Netanyahu has overreacted simply because he was absolutely caught off guard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's yeah. so much uh, evidence of that. That yeah, um, yeah. they, yeah. the Israel, yeah. <laughs> Israeli, um, you know the the they didn't know they didn't said, you know you know as um, security um, group yeah. they they didn't yeah. they missed it they weren't on yeah. top of it at all. Yeah, the U and, U.S. missed it too. We and didn't it was have totally to. embarrassing. I mean, yeah, yeah, humiliating. Yeah, it was like the nine eleven. Well, what's what are you talking about? I I I I, I drifted off into a consciousness thing. Say again what you're saying, please. Well, well, let's 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 um, welcome Mark, and then I'll yeah. Hey, Mark. Hey. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good to see you. Likewise. So we're we're just talking about a lot of things. The string. I won't try to recreate the whole string, but we're talking about Israel right at this moment, and um, and how you know surprise this thing blew up. You know there was this October seventh. There was this invasion of it of uh, Israel that was a shock a shock. You know and um, and it probably shouldn't have been. I mean, the evidence shows that um, there was, it was missed for various reasons, but the uh, Hamas was not taken. They hadn't been doing their, their job, the security forces. And I kind of think that the Hamas were schnooked a little bit too. I mean, I don't know why they didn't think this was going to happen. So I think they were given false hope by yeah. Iran. Yeah. But yeah, it's just dealing with the the conundrums in the situation are really hard. This came out of a, a talk that Lila June, that Robert shared with me, that Lila June Johnson. I don't know if you know who she is, Mark. So she's an American Indian woman, um, daughter of another one whose name, Ani, do you remember her name? I can see her face, but her name's not coming to me. Um, and she, she's done a whole lot of work and she's now working on how to say this bringing back a deep appreciation for men is what her mother's work is right now um, but Lila's talk was sharing a history of the world um, starting with how often different indigenous peoples throughout the world in Bali, in the Americas, in Latin America, have stories of other worlds that have been destroyed. Um, in some it's five worlds and some it's four worlds, but there are other worlds. And we have those stories too, Atlantis and, and that sort of thing, where there have been other civilizations that have been here and then gone. Um, and she feels that this is one. And then she was talking about the the lessons that we learned through collapse basically and how much of a gift 
that is because that seems to be the only way we'll hear the story. It's not like we're not hearing the story. It's not been told, but we haven't really listened to it and taken in the messages that it's gotten. And so the earth herself is just saying, you know, you got to stop. You got to be different. <laughs> and that this collapse will give us that lesson. So she feels it's a true gift that we will come through it on the other side and be different. Finally, have learned to to love each other the way the rest of the world loves itself. Yeah, but one further thing that was very important is that she she stresses the um the significance, the importance of human of humanity on this planet in within the natural world. We are part of the natural world and we play we rightly play a very significant role. And then she point out, pointed out giving examples of how the, the indigenous folk have, have um, perpetuated or enhanced or maintained, actually maintained the natural world around them. And she listed a whole number of different um, steps that were taken by various tribes, various peoples um, that allowed that sustained say the salmon run you know sustained you know the productive value of certain areas of of, of agriculture sustained you know the, the hunting you know um that this didn't just happen it happened because people wisely took steps necessary you know to maintain the um, viability of the natural world around them and so she had this very um, positive view about the, the value of humanity on earth, um, which is really wonderful to hear. She said, you know, maybe most of us are living up to that now, but it doesn't mean that it's not true and not possible. Yeah. yeah. From, from an evolutionary per perspective, there's, there's some... Um, sanity in that we're a young species you know humanity is the youngest species mm. on the earth from what i understand and elizabeth saturus said you know every every sustainable species goes through what we're going through now in terms of fighting and in terms of claiming their own space and, and all that. <clears throat> and that as we mature, we'll stop being crazy. <laughs> and that's kind of what love. Or, or be unsustainable on earth because we're not sustainable yet. We're, we're not as sustainable well, as yet. We were, but we got out of that and now we're going back into it. I mean, I think that's, because the, the indigenous people were sustainable. Yes. They've managed to do just fine for a very, very long time. We're, we're um, talking Euro European. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. In, well, in, some, of, some of the indigenous, the, the Aztecs, for instance, right. and Maya, different civilizations crumbled. Or, not. Yeah. or the Roman Empire, she mentions, that crumbled. Yes. Yeah. And there are distinct and reasons Canyon. over each, you know, that yeah. they that caused yeah. this yeah yeah and yeah i think part of it is 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 the idea of scale um and i think that's where one of the big drivers of us getting off track a lot of what we've done is to deal with the magnitude of us and if we didn't have the magnitude of us there wouldn't have been the push to do some of the things that we have um, uh, i don't understand what you're saying about the magnitude of us well, we managed to deal with food really well. And when a population has food, it multiplies. And that's true of every critter. It doesn't matter what it is. When they have a lot of food, it multiplies. That's just what happens. We have the intelligence to, to manage that. So we had learned to manage the world. We didn't manage ourselves very well. And we we really got into this protecting ourselves against everything else we're we're not going to die boy we are just not going to die <laughs> we are so committed to not dying and 
we have to allow that to happen. Um, and that that's one of the drivers of this culture over some of the other cultures. Um, I, there's, there's power stuff, you know, Atlantis was a story of power. Um, I think Chaco Canyon was a story of power and, and she refers to it that way. I see Chaco Canyon as a monastery actually, where people went to learn to do all that. And when they discovered what they were doing, they stopped. Um, we just got enthralled with not dying. <laughs> and in, in, and in thinking that we're fighting death to keep life, we're actually killing life in order to main to maintain uh, life. We we've stopped seeing that cycle as important and tried to step out of it. Um, we can't. We just can't because the earth can't manage that. And and the things that we did before when there were fewer of us were fine. I mean, it didn't have the impact, but it, when you just scale it up, it does. It's just that's just there. And we're not really looking at scale much in all of our attempts to deal with this. We're not really addressing that issue. Um, we're really afraid to say that somehow or other maybe there need to be fewer of us. And there will be fewer of us. I there's not going to be any choice at this point. Um, the way the earth is changing, I don't think we can manage the food for the number of people that we have here. It just won't happen. Um, so we'll have to, we'll scale back like it always does. And whether we can survive the heat is going to be another issue, but yeah. I I keep, I keep, well, what, what keeps coming up in me is the book Flying Lead Change, which is about uh, horses as more e evolved than us because they are in terms of, being with each other, being a herd, uh, herd men mentality, because we don't have that yet. <laughs> we, everybody's out for themselves and, and this kind of, but, but, but to learn how to be sustainable on earth, and we haven't learned that yet, and may or may not. Yeah. Yeah, the older species all I mean nothing kills its nothing almost almost no other species fights to death. That's not that they don't die because of altercations, but that's mostly because they don't have medicine either. You know, if they break a bone or or get hurt seriously, there's no hope. But they don't deliberately kill each other. They fight to discover who's the stronger. And when they recognize the stronger, they quit. You know. And we don't do that. We want to get clever <laughs> so that we can outfox them in another way. Mm. Uh, I, I don't, I'm happy to say I don't do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to try to be, to treat myself in a way that, that um, keeps me sane, balanced, healthy as best I can oh. so, and we're not doing that as a species that that's why I was I saw the on the, the I saw COVID as a universal prompt to become more self-reflective and to um understand the way that we're doing society isn't really sustainable. Right. Yeah, the peacefulness of Wales really st struck out, stuck out to me as um, how unaggressive they are. Wales, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I They've chosen to live as lightly on the planet as they can. You know, they eat the tiniest thing. Yeah, yeah, with, yeah with they're that. tiny people. I I've been to 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 Wales. the The houses are little. The people are little. The the it's it's interesting. They they are. 
So mm -hmm. I'm talking about the fish whale and you're talking about people in whales. Right. <laughs> <laughs> What, why are you talking about whale, about <laughs> animal? I, I was talking about the, the fish whale, if it's a fish or the mammal whale, because there's such a gentleness in their whole lifestyle. I mean, just think about what they do. They just float around the ocean for their entire life, and they live hundreds of years. If they're allowed to live that long. You know, just enjoying the beauty that they see, being curious, just, you know, being supported by water, just floating around. I mean, what an interesting choice. And they, they came back from land. They got off land. They went back to water to live. But were they on land? Yeah. Yeah. They actually went out, came out off the water to land and went back to water. Did they have legs? Yes. Yeah, the fins are vestiges, yes. Yeah, I do remember slightly some information. Yeah, I mean, that's just amazing to me. I mean, those are interesting choices, really interesting choices. Yeah, and they're, they're, they don't hunt in an aggressive way. They eat plankton. They're vegetable folks. They don't eat meat. Most of them. Some of them do. But yeah, I mean, it's just, yeah, there's, I mean, to your point, Ani, it's really about life trying to figure out how to live with life. And we do it in all these different forms and shapes. And, you know, and the, the journeys are really similar. They just really are. They're really, really similar. Um. Yeah, because it's 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 about species becoming sustainable. Yeah, and being able to live for a long time within the constructs of the planet they're on. And, yeah. And well, there's there's one going on right now that I find incredibly fascinating through TikTok and X. Um, these little shorts. It's about humans getting, you know, forming friendships with wild animals. Yes, yeah. At first I was thinking, oh, that's cute. You know, there's, these are, you know, widespread, you know, examples, but they're pretty disparate. But I'm finding that just looking around Atlanta here, where we have forest running all through the city, and the same thing's happening here. Friends of mine are, are um, you know, sharing stories. It's like the animals are going, the wild animals are going through a change. Um, yes. I guess they call it evolutionary after a bit, yep. but um, they're coming to humans for food. For help. And because we're being fed by, you know, the, the raising of, of our food animals and the crops, we're no longer hunting animals for the most part, wild animals. Right. And so they're coming to us. And um, and so I, I, I'm looking at these, um, there's, there's step to step, on, you know, instruction on YouTube, how to, how to tame a crow, you know, and no, you're teaching a crow to do something new so that it can survive. And maybe it's not even teaching. You're just generating enough trust that the animal will reciprocate, knowing that it can get food from you. And um, it's more than food. It's more than food, Robert. I've been struck. There's all these reels. Um, a bull elk that walked onto traffic and stopped traffic. Yeah, I saw that. And just stood there until somebody got out of their car and followed him because three of his friends were stuck in mud. Um, orca seals that have gone to get somebody in a boat to help. I mean, there's a story after story after story of it's not just food, but recognizing that we're in danger and humans can help. I mean, that's astonishing. That is astonishing. And it's across species. 
Yeah. 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 And I, yeah. I, mean, I didn't notice this until recently. I mean, I, I dare say it's something pretty new. Yeah, there's been so many. Yeah, that was why I oh, recognize it. Within too. 20 years. Yeah, story after story. I remember, this is probably 30 years ago, actually, or maybe even more, maybe 40. There was sort of a general talk about um, a shift in consciousness that had happened. And there were stories of rabbits doing unusual things, having a level of consciousness, ex exhibiting a level of consciousness that we hadn't seen before. Um, and and I felt at the time that that was true, that, that the whole planet had like bloomed <laughs> in a way in, in terms of consciousness um, and that the animals had too. And maybe this is part of that. Um, that there's just an awareness that has not been there before about how we're all connected in a different way. And Animal. they're teaching us as well. I heard yes. this story on NPR yesterday about a young man who was infatuated with rats. He was keeping rats. And he went, he was, it was one of these story hours where someone tells their story. And um he, well, the commentator kept saying, you know, this is absolutely extraordinary. You're telling me things about rats that I never even imagined. They go so harshly against my, you know, imagination of what a rat is and how I should react to it. And suddenly you're telling me that these are darling, intelligent, you know, thoughtful creatures. Loving, yes. It's absolutely what you're talking about. I mean, they're yeah. they're just breaking down preconceptions. Yeah. So, Mark, you put in the chat a link. Do you want to talk about that? Um, not too much, other than that it has, um, if you have heard of it or not, I don't, what is it called? Um, Life on Our Planet or something. It's a recent um, Netflix series that's come out that... Um, attempts to tell oh, somewhat yeah. of a story around um, the movement of, well, I don't want to say it necessarily explains the creation of life um, and the movement of life to land, et cetera, but it's a story about it that um, for many people will have some new information that's not commonly known um, in it. Um, is it talking about some the changes they're going through now because i there are some amazing stories of i haven't got generation. that far in it myself um it's <laughs> still millions hundreds or tens of millions of years at least um ago and and where i'm up to in it um okay so it may be different become modern and might have some modern uh information um but um something that I would feel called to point out is, and this is mostly in in the story that you're just sharing, Robert, is um, you know, this phrase like, you know, seeing or learning things that, you know, people weren't aware of. Like what is implicit in that is an admission that we simply didn't know these things that we thought we did or we thought we did in some way. And um and this sort of comes to parts of that one is like having the humility to know that we don't know the things or the thing, the stories we're telling aren't a tr uh, an accurate reflection of what's happening. But it also invites us to um, ask a slightly deeper question, which is like, what are the limits to which we can know these things or what would we be doing to know them? And um, in many cases, as a member of one species, like our our tools of inquiry are so limited that we we likely won't know them um, in very much detail. And so um, that information in itself is really helpful because it suggests that we don't necessarily need to know them in that much detail and invites us to be um, 
giving our attention and doing other things that aren't so reliant on the precise capturing of specific detail. Like if we can't get it accurately enough, then let's not be structuring the things we're doing to rely on having such precision in our in our um, our inquiry and, and measurement and understanding of some of these things. It's not to say that we we don't need to understand them sufficiently, but maybe not so much in the ways that we've typically tried to understand them. Mark, Mark, could I ask you to say specifically what yes. you're saying? It's very difficult to follow you in the manner in which you're speaking. Can you just say what it is you're saying? Well, I think I said a, a large number of things. Um, uh, in, a, in a logical sequence, but um, what I certainly said was um, what we can take or reflect upon what Robert was saying is that we've had this illusion of knowing these things and we're getting information now to, to confirm to us that we didn't know them. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, when he talked about um, this example of this person understanding rats and in this dialogue what I heard was you know a person responding to that to say that well I didn't realize that about rats like I, I didn't know that and it's simply commenting that that observation reminds us of what we don't know and it also invites us in the possibility of what the limits of what we can know at any specific level of detail is. And from that, it helps us or informs us what we might do and what we might try to know, yeah. especially in the context of us taking actions that allow for us and our communities and our ecosystems and ultimately the world as a whole to be moving in a healthy direction. Like we've been on this like Western science reductionist path for so long, and this is basically saying stop it, like because we're starting to see the folly of it. Yeah, for me it, it points up, and and am I on your same wavelength, Mark? If I say that we've been so separated from nature that we really don't understand it, we have not observed it, we've stopped looking at it, and so we've made up stories about what it is. And we function from those stories. And now we're being brought back into relationship with it and discovering it's really different than what we thought it was. <laughs> now I can I can give you um, in line with this, you want examples, Ani. And going back to this rat story, he gave some extremely poignant um, examples. Evidently, the rats are extremely intelligent. Not only that, they, they, they cared what he thought about them. And how do I mean that? That they learned from him that they were not to go on the counter or get into a certain drawer. And yet food would be missing from those drawers. And he, he put up a GoPro in the kitchen to keep track of what was happening over the night. And he would see these rats team up, the four, three or four of them together to get that drawer or door open. And then <laughs> they would neatly put it all back. You know, not the food, they would take the food, but put everything back in place. And if he happened to, he caught them at one point and they immediately started, started looking at him just like a little kid. That weren't me. <laughs> I didn't do that. And to me, this has implicate in my mind, this has incredibly broad implications about the ability of animals to feel the universe. They're not automate automatons or whatever the pronunciation is. They they are creatures with a complex consciousness that goes way beyond whatever I or 
the writers of the books that I've been reading, you know, have ever comprehended. I mean, this goes way beyond it. Like these stories were absolutely incredible. Now I can't attest to whether he was making them up, but they were incredibly detailed and very funny. <laughs> Well, you know, we don't really think about what a bug goes through in its life. Yeah. But if you really think about it, it's going up and down blades of grass that are huge. It has to survive, find water, find things to eat. How does it do that? What does it have to go through? I mean, they're making decisions constantly that really have to be quite sophisticated in order to survive. I mean, we we have dissed that. We have not given credence to the amount of effort it takes to survive by yourself on the planet with very little help or support from other things. Lots of things live by themselves, pretty much. You know, they may mate and do that. They may have families for a short period of time, take care of kids, and then they go. But there's a lot of very individual life, and it takes a lot of effort, a lot of cleverness, a lot of thinking, a lot of astute understanding to be able to navigate all the difficulties that happen out there. And, and we just dismiss it. We just assume they can make it happen. <laughs> but it's not easy. It, it really speaks to a lot more consciousness than I think we've really given credence to. Um, it just takes a lot of effort to survive. And, and that means that everything thinks, everything understands and makes decisions and choices just at the level of influence they can have. They don't expand beyond that. We've expanded beyond that. That's one of the, our gifts, I guess. Um, but we've not done it necessarily responsibly in community. Yeah. But it's such an eye opener just to realize that yes. there's such a world ready to open up. Yeah. In our yeah. I mean, yeah. sorry. Awesome. I didn't mean to um, catch yeah. you. Yeah. We're, we're all sensorially connected. Mm -hmm. All organisms are coded with senses. And we're all sensorially connected in some way in an interdependent thing we call life. <laughs> yeah. And and it's good to keep in mind. Well, it's another example of how we're all the same. That we're really no different. Unique though. I mean each each Yeah, yeah. Unique and the same at the same time. It's that the whole world is like that. It's this tight loose both and always. Yeah, we're separate and together at the same time yeah you know, we've worked so hard on one we forget the other one or we work on each of them but as separate entities instead of seeing there's any connection I, that's one of the things that i've really enjoyed about um the black community is that there really is such a for me obvious both and the the culture of blackness is so much about uniqueness you, and you see that in dress um black people have very unique ways of dressing i mean they're really flamboyant in their dress and yet there's such a cohesiveness in the community and they're sort of treasured for that that there's a a, a joy in being so different that's kind of a cultural standard, actually, <laughs> in an interesting kind of way. And when I look at them in school, in the schools that I was in, the teachers work really hard to dampen that down. You know, why are you so flamboyant? How do you, you know, you shouldn't do that. We don't do that. Everybody's the same. And we're, of course, not the same. And we all chafe against that. We want to be who we are. <laughs> We want to find out who we are. We want to be the individual we know we are. And our culture doesn't support that at all, you know. Um, but the Black culture does. And it also supports that cohesiveness. We don't support 
being unique and we don't support cohesiveness either. It's just really interesting. It's like we're the reverse of that in an in a interesting kind of way. And I think that's part of the racism stuff is the irritation of that. Noticing that they still are happy in spite of all the nasty things we do, that they still have fun, that they still love each other, even though we're beating on them to be different. How can they, how can they do that? How can they be such an affront to what we're doing? Um, I do think that that's part of it. That's just, they're not, they shouldn't be the way they are because we're trying to make them different and they, and they won't be that. <laughs> it, it's indigenous to the land. I mean, there, there, there's an indig, indig, indigeneity, um, a, a relationship with the land where we white people uh, have branched off from Europe, European 1400s, 1400s. Um, what is, what was 1490? What? 1492? 1492. I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about Columbus, but I'm talking about how they said, go out and conquer, the, go out. And, yeah. and discovery, and if they don't believe we, if they don't look like us and believe like we do, then then the doctrine of discovery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's that's the term I I, I was looking for, because because we Europeans are are coming from that place in some kind of way. There's an influence in our culture in the white. Uh, cu cu culture of the doctrine of discovery still, and yes. and African Americans and in indigenous uh, Native Americans have a different rooting, Rout yeah, rooting. They are rooted more in the land than we white people branched off from Europe and the doctrine of discovery, some kind of way, all of that, all we fit into all of that and are finding our way as intelligently, well, we are not finding our way as intelligently as we can. That's pretty obvious. <laughs> but we could, <laughs> if we wanted to, if it became a social imperative, when it's about there now. You know, I think we're myopic. Um, what, what you said, Annie, uh, um, brought to mind a story. I was listening to a show and these people were in Texas and they were talking about their land and how they loved their land and how they've been on their land for generations and how important it was to them. And I thought, isn't that interesting? Because the Indians had actually been there longer and somehow or other, that never occurred to you that they cared. <laughs> you know, that it would be painful to lose their land. That somehow, <laughs> um, and, and that's, you know, reflective of Palestine and Gaza. Um, it's There's just this myopic, it's all about us. And we forget to understand that everybody else around us is going through exactly the same things. I mean, the birds and the beasts. You know, we've we've chased animals out of their homes, too. And they've all kind of nicely gone. They've moved without protest and tried to find homes in other places. But I've heard stories of developments where rabbits and other things are just wandering lost in the roads because their homes were destroyed. Um, you know, and we don't see that we don't and if we see it we don't take it into our life to say then how should it be different how how could we be different with that so that we aren't causing that kind of pain we're we're not integrating what we know i, I just keep uh, what immature species we're an immature species we we haven't matured yet we we're not sustainable yet. 
because we haven't matured, because life is interdependent. All living organisms are interdependent and that's not uppermost in our minds as a people. To our detriment, eventually, and unless we take responsibility for being an actor on earth in a way that supports life. Well, I want to say a word about um, my experience stemming from our conversations over the years. It's been a couple of years now. Mm. It's been to find find other voices, which, you know, Catherine, you've taught me, finding other voices like um, Kay, Kay, what, what's her name? Um, Layla. 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 Um, people who have a very distinct and new you know, point of view to to actually mine the the differentiation of my own species is something that's become thrilling for me. Um, and devoting myself to to doing this, the um, yeah, whether you, whether you go through different races, but even within our white race, there's mm -hmm. A lot of differences. Speaking to a Nobel laureate, laureate um, scientist is quite a. If you can have a conversation, maybe over a few beers <laughs> or cognac, even better, um, where you know we can really find the, the same language. <laughs> you know, it's amazing what such a mind can be thinking about. You know, thrilling actually. Um, it's, it's, it's a totally new world for me. So there's so much to explore. And I, I see the greatest activism is to enhance that willingness in myself to do that exploring. Mm -hmm. um, if more people did that, we would definitely have some change in this world because you stand in awe then rather than you know, getting disturbed, you know, they don't think the way I do, <laughs> you know, blah, blah, you know, it's, um, that's, an, that's, that's the process that I'm, you know, it's totally enrolled in at this point. I, I had a dog um, in my apartment uh, uh, living. In fact, I, I moved to a place where I could have a dog because there's something about having another species, li living with another species. Yes. That is so enlightening. That is such an opening. Yep. And, and I, I miss that. I, we're not supposed to have do dogs here. Um, anyway, interspecies interactivity yeah. is like vital. Yeah. And, and I don't know how to have that here anymore. Can you do fish or birds? I'm not attracted. They they do, I I don't they don't turn me on. <laughs> they don't interact. Oh, they do. You would be surprised. Yeah. Yes, I was absolutely shocked. My daughter's boyfriend was into saltwater fish, and so they had a lot of tanks. That was actually his job. He took care of saltwater tanks, and they had a box fish, Bell. And she was very conscious. I mean, she was my lesson into, 
oh my God, they do pay attention. They do know. They do see outside that glass. They pay attention to you. They respond to you. Oh yes, they are way more conscious than one would think. And they're find, finding that out about, there are fish that do these incredible designs on the ocean floor. They create patterns. I mean, they're just exquisite. I mean, this takes thought. <laughs> you know, I mean, fish are way more conscious than we think. It's just their body design makes it really hard for us to relate to it. We don't see the same kinds of signals. You know, you have to really watch their actions, which means you have to stay with them for a long period of time to see what they're doing. And it's hard to do underwater. You know, we just don't have that much experience, but it's just astonishing. Um, the whole thing around octopus, octopi, how they recognize people, they respond to people, they appreciate, they do they have games they like to play all of, all these things you know that we're learning because we're spending time with them and we've been so separated from the planet we just don't see it anymore and so we make up stories about how it is or how it couldn't be because it's so different from us but it's not yeah that's just yeah we're really re-engaging with that in a very interesting way in a lot of ways mm -hmm. yeah, that we haven't before just to watch it just to see what life looks like so, from another perspective have you ever had a bird or a fish that you lived with i've had fish yes and i've had a bird actually yes yeah no i always have seen animals as beings they yeah. just are they're all unique. They all have a personality. They, they have. A, they're just there. There is something there that's alive. That's reacting. That's that's a being. I don't know how else to say it. I mean, calling them people works fine for me, because they're exactly like us. They're just different. Uh, all, all all living beings have co cognition. Yeah, uh, they uh, have to. They have to in order to survive. It takes so much effort, so much cognitive ability to just survive. Yeah, you have to have it. Yeah. And it's just fun to see their choices. I mean, you can learn so much from it. And I think we have historically. I really do. I think that early on when we didn't have houses and cement roads and all that kind of stuff, we were more immersed. And we did watch. We saw what animals did and learned from them oh my gosh they they like this particular plant maybe we can eat it too i don't know i'm sure that that's how a lot of our learning came from is just watching the rest of the of life and seeing what it survives on and how it survives and how it makes its houses and all that kind of stuff and then we've applied it in our own way and we just forgot but that's those are the gifts we got from the rest of the planet I'm going to visit the pet store today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you can also go help out at the Humane Society. You can walk dogs down there. Yeah, well, I, I, I can walk to the pet store. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Really don't miss a car. You, you know, I haven't had a car since January 31st, 2021. Has it been that long? I remember when the car disappeared, but I didn't think it's been four years. 21, yeah. Hmm, yeah. Yeah, I want horses. I would really like to have a horse. It's just oh, that's a, a I want to visit a good range, you know, you can ride. That's a that's a good distance to to go during a day. <laughs> I mean, I could go to the grocery store and a horse in a heartbeat. It would be just fine. <laughs> I just want to stand with one and just like feel it, like energetically exchange and touch it and 
have it respond to me and me respond to it. Yeah, yeah, I used to have horses, so I've kind of gotten them to missing them. Mm. Yeah, <sighs> animals are just great. They really are. Any last words from anyone? Oh my gosh, we are at time. It's gone fast. You've been so quiet, Mark. <laughs> hmm. Contemplating or just drifting, Mark? Um, They're the same. Yeah. Time. Well, I th I think like in a conversation that sort of covers so much territory as this, um, <laughs> there, and this isn't a judgmental um, observation, but what it means is in a conversation, we end up like stacking up the delusion in it because um, when we're coming at things from our own specific experience especially when it's not an experience which is informed by the fundamentals of the world which you know is a journey to understand in itself you know we almost almost everything that comes out of our mouth is like 80 percent true or you know some percentage less than 100 percent sort of true and so then um with that, it means that there's whatever um, opposite of that that's sort of untrue. And so then the question becomes like, what is helpful to point to that would um, would would support movement of not only the conversation, but also like how we're thinking about it. Um, and I think if I was to like point to one thing, um, that is maybe easier because I've talked about it, not necessarily in this group, but like in other groups of four, is, is the diversity point where if we're talking about something specific and the people talking about the thing have legitimately different perspectives on that thing, then diversity um, can be really helpful. So this is the example of the seven blind men and the elephant. Um, like that's a helpful um, instance of diversity because we are looking about at something specific. However, because we're in this period where um, the understanding that different people have of the fundamentals of our world um, covers a full, a really large spectrum, what that gets us into the position of is many people talking about something that don't have a sufficient relationship with the thing that they're talking about, that what they are saying about it, even though it is different, it really doesn't have much use because it is a perspective that is insufficiently uh, informed. And so like um, that, that is a suggestion to, for us to be careful about like um, always um, uh, defaulting or like um, thinking that a diversity of perspectives is important because it really does matter like how foundational that perspective is coming from. And when that foundation isn't there, um, it, it means that whatever is being stated can often be um, uh, not containing enough sing signal to really be helpful. And so like, if I was to say one more thing about this, you know, whenever we're talking about something and there is sort of quote unquote a disagreement, um, you know, we might want to say, well, that is simply like two different perspectives. And so let's be inclusive of both of them. Uh, in this sort of example, I'm, I'm suggesting where there might be two. Instead of doing that, um, going below below the surface and coming back to the point where that there is a shared understanding of things and starting from that as common ground and then moving forwards again back uh, forwards again back into knowing the thing better without um, sort of having these ungrounded different perspectives that 
might not actually be fundamentally connected to the thing we're talking about. So I guess that's just a really long way of saying that um, uh, it really matters as to what the degree of relationship that a person has with the thing they're talking about. And when that relationship is insufficient or certainly not fundamental, we do have to be careful as to how much um, weight we might give to it. And so I would ask you if you saw that in our conversation and where. Oh, I think we do it all the time. Every one of us, like every moment by moment, um, because because we are products of a world that hasn't fundamentally understood it. And so that's in some ways like what correlates with the coming about of a healthy, sustainable world is us all becoming the version of ourselves in that in that world. And so that by definition means that we are currently all doing this um, at the moment and that we probably, each one of us will continue to do it for the rest of our lives because this moment in the future of like a healthy world is probably beyond um, all of our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can you can you have something that I used to, I learned at my grandfather's knee. Um, he loved telling stories and he made it very clear that he was embellishing. He said, you can't have a good story without adding the latest touch. But I'm telling you, I, my sisters, my cousins, we used to flock to his knee, so to speak. Basically, we had tea, which meant a glass of whiskey as we got older. But, you know, <laughs> why? Because we were learning a different way. We were learning through affect emotional. I couldn't agree with you more as far as learning and developing a systematic understanding of something. You're absolutely correct. And um, but I would say there is there's value in this other mode as well. But it pays to be clear about which which mode you're speaking in, I would say. Yeah, I agree with that. Ani, you had a question or thought? I was just because Robert nodded his head as Mark was talking. If and and Catherine, you did too. If you could tell me what Mark was saying, <laughs> I didn't get it. It was just so abstract. And so, so Mark, tell me if I have it right with this example. Um, for me, the clearest example of that is when you're talking with someone whose whole frame of reference is human centric about something that is actually life centric. You can be sort of saying the same things, but you're going like this and you can feel that there's not a meeting, that there's something that's not quite right there, but it's hard to put your finger on it. And without going deeper into understanding the, that, that found, fundamental foundational context, it's really hard to really connect and to, to do good work together because you're at different odds. You have different purposes, different intents. Um, for me, in I got to go back to Lila June's talk that comes from value systems. That's why I've been so strong on value systems because the, the three value systems are so different and we all see them as the same and they are interchanged willy-nilly and, and they're self-destructive when you interchange them because they're only good when they're coherent and if we don't understand how to keep them coherent then we don't really get the value out of them we just get the mess that that makes um yeah so that's why that really makes a difference to me could you say more unpack and unpack the three value systems so i've talked about them before that there's a value system that's all about protection there is a value system that's all about being effective in exchange, basically. And this is the work of Jane Jacobs that comes out of her research. Um, 
And she posited these two value systems. And then the third one is life-centric, which is the one being born now, I believe. But they have very different intents. So you can be safe, you can be effective, or you can be life-enhancing. Now, you can be life-enhancing and you can be safe and you can be effective, but you cannot be effective and life-enhancing. <laughs> sometimes those have a problem with each other. And sometimes safety is sacrificed there as well. And you can be safe, but not really effective because you're really undermining your ability to be effective. Um, and Israel is a perfect example of that, trying to be very safe and absolutely undermining the, actually their ability to be safe in their actions. You know, so it's under, if they were life-centric, it would totally shift everything they're doing and they would feel safe and they would be effective. So I see these as concentric circles or balls or whatever that they're, they're, ways that we have expanded our consciousness being really fearful is a very small space you don't want a whole lot in that you want to simplify it and, and minimize it because you can control only so much so it really shortens and and makes small your world in a very real way and you're deliberately doing that when you get more expansive and you want to do things then you try and figure out how to include the other in some sort of way which is what those values are all about. You want to be honest. You want to do that kind of stuff. But that's also limited because we have a bigger world outside of there. And that's where we are. We're now seeing our integration with the rest of the world and the necessity for that requires a different value system. It has to be life-centric. It can't be centric in those other things. But we are very familiar with those. And we will knee-jerk back to safety in a heartbeat when we feel we're threatened. It is, that's where all the populist stuff comes from. You want a strong person, you want an authority to be loyal to, that's part of that value system. And it just pops up and it makes perfect sense and everybody understands it, but it's ineffective. It's only effective in very small spaces because that's all you can manage. If you're in a bigger space, you, you fight, you, you destroy yourself in doing that and we see it i mean we've absolutely said you know russia and israel are perfect examples of that having great fear and destroying the things around them they are not creating safety for themselves they're doing exactly the opposite but you can't tell them that they're so sure that they're safer if they do this and it's wrong I like what you're saying value systems, protection, efficiency, and life-centric. Yeah. And life, uh, with life-centric being... Life. What work. Yeah. Everything. It's a terribly different frame. Yeah. Well, I promised my wife I would help her out. So in terms <laughs> you gotta of go. all three of those value systems, I think I'd better go. We got go with safety. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here. It was really great. Appreciate it. Too. Yeah. Have a good afternoon. Okay. Bye-bye.